as we do here at Texas A&M. Howdy. Howdy. Very nice, very nice. Hi, I'm Orrin Finch. I'm the director of the George Bush Presidential Library and Museum, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, you all here tonight. Um, my duty is to thank all of our sponsors, which I'll, I'll do in just a second, but I'd like to uh, recognize a few people who are in the audience with us. Emma Carrasco uh, is the Chief Marketing and Engagement Officer and Senior VP for Global Strategy at National Geographic. And then Brenda Barr is also with us from the National Geographic. Uh, she is the Region 1 Education Director. She went to the University of Alabama. <coughs> Sorry, that's just a person. That's just a personal side. Um, <laughs> gig them, right? Gig them, exactly. <laughs> also with us tonight, somewhere I saw him, Tom Putnam, who's special assistant for presidential libraries and the former director of the John F. Kennedy Library. So thank you, Tom, for being here. I uh, also like to thank our, our staff, uh, staff of the conference center, and uh, everyone who's helping with this event, especially Shirley Hammond and her staff. Uh, thank you all. Um, we have some great partners tonight. Uh, David Jones and the uh, George Bush Presidential Library Foundation. The foundation is very generous to us. They're uh, very good to the library, and so I'd like to thank the foundation for their support. Also, I'd like to uh, thank the National Geographic Society. They're also supporting the event tonight, and they also uh, were very supportive of an event we did earlier today, a great event with uh, 600 kids here in the, um, in the conference center uh, talking about how geography is important, and tonight we'll talk about how geography uh, matters. Also, I'd very much like to thank the, uh, the uh, Texas A&M University Education and Human Development. They have also been great, great help for the event tonight. Lynn Burbaugh from their department is, um, will be chairing the, uh, chairing the event discussion tonight. And then it is my great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Joyce Alexander, who is the sixth dean of the College of Education and Human Development at Texas A&M University, Gigum. She is also the current holder of the uh, Retta Hayes Dean's Endowed Chair and is a professor in the Department of Educational Psychology. She received a B.S. in Psychology from Texas Wesleyan University and a Master's of Arts, Arts and a Ph.D. in Education uh, Psychology from the University of Georgia. Prior to her time at Texas A&M, Dr. Alexander served as Executive Associate Dean in the School of Education at Indiana University Bloomington, where she had been a member of the faculty since 1992. Please, uh, Help me welcome Dr. Alexander to the podium. Well, thank you, Mr. Finch, for that wonderful introduction and for truly thanking, thanking National Geographic for helping to uh, make this happen as well as the Bush Library. You know, the importance of understanding how humans interact with geography cannot be understated. Uh, it's so important for us as global citizens to understand how our world works, both on the natural level as well as the human level. This topic is important to me as dean of the college, mostly because this is where we help prepare teachers and school administrators who are charged with making sure that the young minds of today and tomorrow really understand uh, this issue. But this isn't about me today. I want to take just a moment to uh, recognize our panel members. So uh, Dr. Lynn Burball, he's a professor of curriculum and instruction and the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Culture in our college. He's a former high school history teacher, and his research focuses on the education of students and teachers, both in Texas and Colorado, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Dr. Walter Kampfhofer, Kamp Kamp there we go, 
is a professor of history in the College of Liberal Arts here at Texas A&M. He's published widely in the field of immigration and ethnicity with articles in four languages and three books out in both German and English. He's known as a pioneer of transatlantic linkage studies due to his monograph, The Westphalians from Germany to Missouri. Dr. Raymond Robertson is a professor and holder of the Helen and Roy Ryu Chair in Economics and Government in the Department of International Affairs at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. Widely published in the field of labor economics and international economics, Robertson has served the U.S. Department of Labor, the State Department, and the Center for Global Development. Our last speaker, Mr. Alex Tate, is the geographer for the National Geographic Society. In his role, he leads the MAP Policy Committee to monitor and evaluate geopolitical and other changes in the world. Besides promoting best practices in mapping through the Center of Excellence for Mapping, he contributes his time and to promote geoliteracy through educational programs such as this one. So I want to thank our panelists for being here today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Burlbaugh. First, I'd like to thank the people who made this possible tonight again, National Geographic Society, the College of Education, the Bush School, the Bush Library. Um, thank Mr. Finch and Dr. Alexander for the introductions. The, there's one person missing from this panel, and I'd like to recognize that, that the geography department, we contacted the geography department, and we had some difficulty in arranging the schedules for someone to be here. So we didn't intentionally leave off the geography department because the title does say geography matters. But I just wanted you to know and for them to know that we, we did contact them and we just couldn't get the, the schedule worked out. So thank you for coming. Thank you for spending your evening with, with us. I'm going to tell you how we're going to operate and then we'll start. So we're going to have three different questions we're going to talk about. The first one is why geography matters. And we're going to talk, each of us is going to talk a little bit about how, from our perspective, geography matters. And then we're going to talk about the state of ge geography and geographic education in the United States today and why that's important to do that. And then we're going to talk about, last, how, from our perspectives, we can help the citizens of the United States have a better geographic understanding of the world, or where they are, and where they're doing it. So, as I said, the title is Geography Matters. And so I guess the first thing we should do is find out why does geography matter? Alex? <laughs> okay. Well, I He's have a geographer, right? <laughs> I have degrees in geography, so I can represent the geography department, okay. even though I did not go to school at A&M. Um, and as a geographer, of course, I think geography matters. I've spent my life studying geography. Um, geography is about where, where things are, but just as importantly, why they are, where they are. And one of the things about geography is that it integrates with just about every other discipline in a university. So I was, as an undergraduate learning about geography, there was economic geography, there was historical geography, there was political geography, there was biogeography, which I studied as an under, undergraduate. And so all these disciplines uh, overlap on geography because it's a framework for understanding where things are and why they are where they are. And uh, so, the interdependence is very important. And one of my colleagues likes to say that, that for history, geography is the stage upon which history happens. And you can understand history better through geography. Um, a couple of examples of why geography matters. I like to pull a few from George H.W. Bush's presidential era. The Operation Desert Storm, when they had to go to battle in a desert environment. Well, most of the US Army had a history of fighting in a jungle or a forest environment. So they had to repaint things. They had to retread the tanks. Um, understanding how the environment interrelates with the human population and the human endeavor on the Earth is very important. It's something that geography really specializes in. An interesting thing related to that desert storm, the, the war, was that when the Iraqis were sending scuds towards Israel, Cleveland happened to have an earthquake. 
and the news media were inundated by calls wondering if the scuds were coming to Cleveland. <laughs> so, I mean, physical geography and cultural geography, the whole thing. So. And I would like to just bring up one more aspect of geography that's very important, and it also relates to Bush's presidential era, and that's the idea of mapping the world and, and being able to visualize patterns in the world through maps. And of course, at the end of the Cold War, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of uh, the dis uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union and the changes in Eastern Europe. There's a lot of remapping that had to happen. And some of the remapping uh, and the division of areas ignored ethnic groups. Uh, and so the interrelation, again, of the physical geography and the human geography through maps um, helps us understand the world. Okay, Raymond? Yeah, I also wanted to thank the organizers and thank all of you for coming tonight. It's an honor for me to be here next to these very distinguished people. I'm very flattered and honored. Thank you very much. And my job, I teach master's students at the Bush School in the International Relations Department. So my job is not nearly as hard as Alex was to redraw these maps all the time, which is much more difficult. One of the things that I was thinking about in terms of how important geography is, it's extremely important. And I'm thankful every day for those who teach geography. It happens to, uh, actually affect the fact that we're here. I know that there was a lot of concern whether or not we'd even be here tonight because the government was on a shutdown, as you know, earlier in the week. And the holding point, the debated point in Congress had to do with immigration. And there's a lot of people, I think, in America who don't appreciate that. They're asking these questions. Where are these people from? Why are they coming here? What is their motivation? What are the conditions like in the countries where they left that would motivate them to come? Americans don't understand these questions, but these are critical questions for geography. And it's critical that we understand geography in order to answer them. There's other questions as well that I think motivate geography. One of the things they say about public speaking is that if you get very nervous, you're supposed to imagine your audience with no clothes. That doesn't work for me at all. I study clothing, and I'm glad you all are clothed. <laughs> But one of the things that I hope you'll do later on is when you get back, check the labels on your clothes because every single garment of clothing that you're wearing tonight has a name of a country on it. And that's the country that produced the clothing that you all are wearing tonight. Where are these clothes from? Who are the people making these clothes? These are things that are literally touching you at this moment as we speak. It's critical to understand where these people are from and what they're doing. And a little bit, on a little bit more serious note, I remember uh, back September 11th, uh, back in 2001, when we had that tragic day, so many Americans were asking the question, why do they hate us? Who are these people? Why are they attacking us? Where are they from? Americans didn't have a very good understanding of geography and the conditions outside this country, which led, of course, potentially to tragic consequences. Understanding these events, the clothes we wear, why we're here, are all critical elements of geography, and I think it's incredibly important that we have a good understanding. Raymond, some of the material things that we buy, you'll, you'll see made in the United States, but assembled in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And that tells you a relationship what's going on there. All the time. So, so you were talking about immigration, which is a really good lead into Walter. Yes, yeah, funny you should mention that. Uh, <laughs> our uh, chair here mentioned my first book, uh, which the real theme of was chain migration about which we've been hearing a lot uh, recently. A um, little secret I'll let you in on. Chain migration is much older than the recent American uh, visa policies that give preferences to family members. In fact, uh, you know, my study involved Germans and there's other uh, parallel studies involving, let me see, uh, Norwegian, Swedes, uh, Slovaks, uh, Dutch, uh, Italians. Spanish, Italians, uh, Portuguese, um, all of them documenting chain migration before there were any of these family reunification uh, visa policies. In fact, if you look at the figures, chain migration back then when immigration of Europeans was totally unrestricted, was uh, made up a higher proportion of the migration than it does today. Uh, it was close to 80% then. Nowadays, it's only about 60, 65% of people that come on family visas. The other thing about it is, it's very functional. It reduces culture shock. 
uh, the reigning paradigm when I was a grad student was uh, uprooted. We turned that to transplanted. Uh, and, you know, the historians and historical geographers, uh, that was really their contribution to a paradigm shift, I would have to say. The other thing you might want to think about with respect to immigration is to realize that immigrants are not, by any means, a cross-section of the country they come from. Uh, you know, I, as late as the year 2000, the country whose immigrants had the highest proportion of college graduates was, anybody know? India. I'm talking about continents. Oh. India, you're right, but if you did continents, you would be wrong. Uh, it's not Asia. North America? The AGs would guess all over the map, including Antarctica, before they finally hit on Africa. Africa has the highest, had the highest proportion with college degrees. Uh, Asians have gained on them a little bit in the ensuing decade, but uh, if you take the proportion with some college education at least, um, Africans are still slightly ahead of Asians. Uh, it's a well-kept secret, but very important, I would say, for our immigration policies. So, so Alex, today during your presentation, and those of you, some of you saw it, didn't, he was talking about China mm -hmm. and how China approximates some of the things. And in geography, we talk about China be the most similar country or similar area to Texas as far as climate and things that there's mountains to the west and there's the coastal plain and various things like that. And so you know, how, how are things in Texas and today when you were showing where is the dry part of Texas? The same place the dry part of China is in the west. Where is the wet part of Texas? In the, in the eastern portion. So very similar to that. We have the same type of continental weather patterns that come down to, to do that. And so that helps understand some of the things. You know, that's making that parallel to Texas students to help understand China to do that. Um, I like to think, and, and, you know, students, it's kind of amazing to me that we have students here in the Bryan College Station area who have never been out of the county. And we have students who have never been out of the state. And I've taken students overseas on study abroad, and I had some that was the first time they ever flew was to, to fly to, to London and things like that. And so for them to understand where they're going is really important. I, my wife and I just came back from a conference in Hawaii, and we were in Hawaii on the Saturday when the alarm went off for the possible um, nuclear attack from, from North Korea. And uh, there was two different responses, and this is kind of interesting. Um, we were on the big island of Hawaii, and there wasn't a lot of concern there. Uh, partially that those of the Hawaiians there knew that Honolulu was 350 miles away, and that's probably where the rockets would go. <laughs> but they also had just had an air raid warning on the 1st of January. They were testing their systems and doing that. And so they knew that if this was real, the air raid would have gone off. And so they said, well, it must not be real because the air raid didn't go off. Now my understanding is, because we weren't there, that in Honolulu, that Waikiki Beach just Dis people just disappeared, and that is primarily tourists that just went absolutely crazy because of this, this attack. The Wall Street Journal had an article last week talking about this, and that the people, and this is related to geography, that there are many people who moved to Hawaii because it's different there than on the mainland. But they were sort of brought up short, is that mainland policy might impact them first. <laughs> That just because they were no longer over there, well, it might hit us first. And so there's lots of things related to geography that helps you understand, just like I said about the Cleveland situation, um, as to what's happening there to, to do that, and to why students need to know this. I challenge middle school teachers who are teaching seventh grade, and for those of you who don't know, seventh grade is Texas history. And I asked them, so when was the last time you took your students outside to see the geography of Texas? It's right outside your classroom. And a lot of them have never thought about that. That geography is always someplace, something someplace else, but it's very close to us. So other thoughts on? 
Well, I think uh, it's very important to look at both the local scale and the global scale in studying geography. And uh, you know, I also think it's vitally important, and National Geographic really supports this, of getting kids out of the classroom and understanding the environment that's, that's all around them, whether it's you know, looking at the natural environment or, or, or looking at the cultural environment. Both things are, are equally important to get out of the classroom to understand your local environment. But I also think that understanding the global environment from afar is still really important and, and, and very, a very valid study. I think it's really great when somebody goes someplace abroad and you get a particular interest in that place. Like I think this has happened to most people. When I go to a country, I recently went to Nepal for the first time, I like all of a sudden had a real desire to understand the history of Nepal, understand its current situation, where, you know, where Nepal, why Nepalese are coming to America, why they're, some of them are going to India, some Indians are going to, you start wanting, getting very curious about the places that you go to. Um, and you know, these global crises, are often a spur for people to start being curious about the world. People are much more curious about North Korea. They're curious about the circumference of a missile, missile's range. If it can go 3,000 miles, well, hey, let's draw a circle on the map and see what it can touch. Um, and uh, you know, in some ways, it's unfortunate that it takes world crises to, to spur this interest, but it's also a, a great way to have people start understanding about the world. There is a quote that I, I love to bring up. Um, you may have heard it before. It's uh, often attributed to Ambo, Ambrose Bierce. And supposedly he said that war or crises, that's God's way of teaching Americans about geography. <laughs> <laughs> Very appropriate there. So. so when I was growing up, my family traveled, we took a vacation every summer, so I got a lot of local geography. But uh, I grew up in the 1950s during the Cold War and uh, lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we didn't really worry about too much about the global attack or the attack because we knew with the SAC Air Force Base, a refueling base, Sandia Army Base, and the Manzano uh, Missile de Ur bomb center, there wasn't going to be a lot of choice was going to happen. Albuquerque was going to get it. <laughs> but I, I was interested in, and this is where geography and types of geography is, I'd looked at, spent my whole life looking at flat maps. I had a real difficult time understanding why the United States had built these three dew line radar stations across Canada. Because Russia was over here on the map and over there on the map, and so why were we building the, the so it wasn't until I got a globe that I could see that the closest, the, easiest way to get to the United States from Russia was over the pole, and that's why it was there. And so it made a lot of sense. But I wouldn't have had that had I not had the opportunity to look at a globe and see the geographic relationship between places. And those Mercator projections are a communist conspiracy. Uh, <laughs> they exaggerate the size of countries closer to the poles, yeah. and the Russia was one that got its size exaggerated yeah. thereby. So why is Greenland not a continent when Australia is, right? <laughs> yeah, so, 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 mm. so any last thoughts on why geography matters, why it's important before we move I, I on? I think this, bringing up the Mercator projection is a wonderful uh, example because it's very ironic. The uh, education system in the United States and in many countries went away from the Mercator projection because of its gross distortions of area. Along comes Google Maps. <laughs> Guess what projection Google Maps is on? Um, it's a Mercator proje projection. Yeah. Now, the Mercator projection works really well when you're zoomed way in and you're looking at a very uh, large scale area, a very small um, part of the world. But when you're looking at the globe or the extent of the world, it does very grossly distort shapes. That's why I was very happy when Google Earth came along. And I always recommend to teachers, to educators, that they use Google Earth they don't have a globe in the classroom, which I think they always should, but Google Earth's a great way to show spatial relationships so that you know that the Great Circle route from Washington, D.C. to Seoul, Korea for the airplane, you fly north of Alaska. You know, you are in the Arctic Ocean for part of that journey, and it's amazing to do this. So, so where, where are we on geographic education and, and the use of geography in, in society today? Well, I think there's hopeful signs. Uh, I always in, 
enjoy talking to sixth graders like I did this morning. They are studying geography, and I think most uh, state school systems, uh, they do emphasize teaching geography. Sometimes it's not in an independent geography class, which I wish it were. Sometimes it's with social studies. Um, but I think that we're heading in the right direction to get more geography and have geography more integrated. Um, I think it's important to have it at several levels of the education system. So you're talking about learning about your local geography. In Maryland, for example, they start with Maryland and then do world geography. I don't know if it's the other way around in Texas. Um, so geography at the sixth grade is in the world cultures class. Exactly. And then Unfortunately, they, geography has been taken out of the high school. I was disappointed I mean, it's still to hear available. that. Yes. It's still available, but, yeah, not, but it's not, not every required. student has to take it. Um, and so it, it used so to be required. So I, I think it, uh, it's, it's also interesting, you know, sort of in a, in a worldwide context, that in some countries, geography is, is taught much more extensively as a standalone discipline, and sometimes it's integrated with other social sciences. So at National Geographic, we think it's very important to keep promoting geography however we can, whether it's within a social science context or in a standalone geography class. And I think it's very important both at uh, elementary and middle school and at the high school level. Several years ago, I had an elementary teacher tell me there's no geography at the elementary school. And so uh, using the five themes of geography, which National Geographic's moved away from, or the Geographic Society's moved away from, which I think was a mistake, but <laughs> <laughs> because they went to 18 standards. and five you can remember, 18 you have to have to really. I can't remember them. You can't remember them, yeah. I mean, Joyce will know you can only chunk seven things, right? Uh, so when you go to 18, you got too many. But there's absolute and relative location. And in a classroom, you have kids sit behind someone, in front of someone, that's relative location. You have classrooms that are certain places, an absolute location, classroom one for the first grade. And so I explained to her that, and the, all of the relational verbs, beneath and above and over and beside, all those are geographic terms. Absolutely. That they teach in the elementary school. And they teach where their school is in their community, right. where their homes are. To do that, yeah. so, so there's geography even at the elementary level. So, Raymond? Yeah, thank you. I think it's been pretty clear to all of us that it's increasingly difficult to feel isolated from the rest of the world, whether or not you're looking at national politics, the things that are going on in the national scheme, but even here in Texas, it's very ubiquitous, the influence of other countries. If you look at trade, if you look at production, if you look at the last election, one of the big, the two of the big points in the last election, of course, were NAFTA, which is our trade agreement with Mexico, and China, and the trade deficits we have with China. And I think people are beginning to realize that you cannot escape the reach of geography. And even though there is a resistance and we want to pull back a little bit, it seems like that's fighting against a, a bigger tide. And I realize that in some schools, they're pulling back a little bit in different areas. But I think if you step back and take a much larger view of the longer run trends, the United States is perhaps going kicking and screaming, but becoming part of a very, very globalized world. If you look at BBC News, or if you go to Europe, or Mexico, or Argentina, places in Africa, Zimbabwe, um, you look at in Asia, of course, people have a very acute understanding of geography. They understand distances, they understand relationships, they understand the different countries, the topography uh, that Americans don't have yet. And I think as we increase our interactions with other countries, I think we'll become more cognizant and aware of the importance of geography. So I'm an optimist. I'm definitely an optimist about where we're going, and I think that uh, we're going to embrace geography more and more in the future. So I'm definitely an optimist. Walter? Yeah, uh, I have the impression that geography is better represented at the elementary and high school levels than it is at the university level. Uh, in fact, you know, places like University of Chicago that axed it, fortunately, they didn't ax the actual <laughs> people, but nonetheless, uh, Harvard? They're, you know, I'm very indebted to historical geographers. About half of those uh, chain migration studies that I was talking about were done by actually historical geographers rather than historians. It's a little hard to tell the difference between the two, except the historical geographers tend to have better graphics in their books. Than <laughs> we do. But uh, no, and uh, it's a very good point about global awareness uh, and staying current. Uh, I think most people do not realize 
how much Mexican birth rates have fallen since 1960. I believe it was 6.8 children per woman then. It's down to 2.2, which is just barely above replacement level. Uh, so there is no longer the demographic push in Mexico. So, you know, assuming that um, we don't kill NAFTA and <laughs> plunge them into a depression, uh, there's not going to be the kind of uh, push for Mexican immigration that there was historically. In fact, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Dudley Poston, now retired recently, uh, you know, pointed out since since 2013, there have been more immigrants coming in from China than from mm -hmm. Mexico. And, uh, and India. You know, Central America, it's more driven by violence than by demography. Mm -hmm. uh, like Costa Rica uh, is below replacement in its birth rate, and uh, Nicaragua is the same as Mexico, and, and uh, you know, it's only Guatemala and Honduras that have higher birth rates than 2.2. So, uh, you know, things are shifting in that respect, and uh, they're going to affect American migration. Mm -hmm. right. then, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't think you can overstate the importance of the interconnectedness in the world today. Uh, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa was, is a great example, and, and diseases that spread through the airline system, through, you know, so that things don't stay in one place. Exotic animals get released in Florida, so you have Burmese pythons. <laughs> this is an interconnected world. You can't get away from that fact. So it's an interconnected world in the, in the natural world, but particularly the human world is interconnected in a way that we just can't. Uh, ignore. We have to, to embrace it and understand it uh, and have Americans be just as curious about Europe as Europeans are about America. I think that's one of the differences I see when I'm visiting in Europe is how much American news there is there versus we have a lot less foreign news uh, in general here. Mm -hmm. One of Texas's uh, less desirable exports by way of airplanes is fire ants. Ah. <laughs> fire ants get on planes and they land other places and they drop them off there to do that. But fire ants themselves are an import, right? Yes, they are. <laughs> yeah, they're important. So, Raymond, you were talking earlier about looking at your clothes and things like that. Uh, geography in the grocery store mm -hmm. and the food that we have mm -hmm. is so dependent on geography. Mm -hmm. because, and it's even easier now that the government has required you to label the food as to where it comes from. Yep. So you go look at your fruits and your vegetables, things that are available now. They're from Chile, they're from Argentina, uh, mm -hmm. they come from Mexico, various places. And uh, our whole way of life, food-wise, has mm -hmm. changed because of what those places have that we don't have when we need them or when we want those things. And so the seasonality of our food is much different now as a result of geography mm -hmm. and transportation than it was before to do that. Um, yeah, I know I'm not the only one here who's a fan of guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> and Alex, you were, you were talking, um, ooh, it just went away. Oh, it'll come back. But, uh, so, well, oh, you're talking about Google Earth. So my wife can tell you, she's sitting here down the front row, is that my iPad is really important during the news because the news media last night they were talking about a subdivision in Bryan that has a drainage problem. Well, where is that subdivision? Just Google up Castle Heights. Oh, it's right there off of 21. And so, so that, that Google Earth makes it, or the mapping programs make it yeah. so easy to find things mm -hmm. that when they mention it on the news or national news or things like that, that uh, we couldn't do before. Uh, it'd be very difficult because they don't necessarily update the, the city maps often enough to, to know where those things are, and, but that appears on there to do that. Um, well, may I sure. build yeah. on that a little bit? I have two boys at home, they're 14 and 11, and they consider Google Earth a game, a video <laughs> game that they play. They said, oh, let's just go look around and see if we can find this country or find this place, and they spend a good hour and a half just searching the world and discovering, and then you can zoom in and actually look at the people in the houses, not the people's faces, but the houses and the places and, and the environment, and they can zoom in, and they think it's a game, and I do not dissuade them at all. Yeah, yeah. I said, you can play on Google Earth all you, you want. You should tell That's them great. that you're going to limit it to 
two hours. You can't milk. That's right. That's right. No more. That's why I said hour and a half. That's why I said <laughs> hour and a half. Yeah, that's their limit. We have, and it's a lot easier to look on an iPad or something for Google Earth than it used to be looking in the atlases, mm -hmm. which yeah. I did when I was growing up, was mm -hmm. to look in atlases and things like that. Um, I was raised in New, New Mexico most of my life and liked Westerns and knew about Billy the Kid and knew about the Lincoln County War. And some of you may know about that. And uh, it was so bad that the governor of New Mexico, the territory, had to send in the militia to put it down. Well, Lincoln County is this little bitty county in the center of Texas, or center of New Mexico. I deer hunted there and knew about Lincoln. I ran across an 1891 map. And Lincoln County is the southeast fourth of the state. <laughs> it's a huge portion of the state, you know, the counties. But just not knowing that geography of that time versus now, once I saw that, it really made sense as to why when that whole Lincoln County was inflamed because of the war, the, the fighting, that the governor said, we ought to do something about this. And so it was having- enough to have a war in back then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was, yeah, well, called the Lincoln County War to do that. But uh, just the role of maps mm. and, and knowing what maps are, and you were talking earlier about the division of, of places and the whole works that's going on in the Middle East, the whole problem right now Let is tell you, it's 1914 mapping. One of the 1914. most challenging areas to map with uh, taking into consideration all the geopolitical implications of what you map for countries that you want to maintain good relationships with right. for an uh, organization like National Geographic. It's a big challenge. But maps are a crucial part of geography. And it's a crucial part of geography education is we need to have our students and our, our American public understand both the power of maps to, to inform us and to tell us about things, but also their limitations because maps tell a story that somebody intended to tell. Maps aren't completely objective. There are very many ways of making maps of a certain area. You can include th some things and not include other things. Even satellite imagery and air photos, they don't always show you everything. If you have a very forested area, you don't know what's in it. Um, you don't see all the features that may be in an area. So it's, a, it's important to teach about maps and especially with the ubiquity of Google Maps and Google Earth. There's actually a book called How to Lie with Maps. That's yep. a great book. Mark Monmanier. <laughs> highly recommend it. It's a, it's a, a geographer. Good yeah, it's a good book as to how you can present things yeah. or not present things to, to do that. So anything else, Raymond? On? Yeah, I really think the importance of maps is absolutely critical. One of the things I teach at the Bush School is a class on Latin American economic development. And my students don't always like it, but the first assignment is a map quiz on Latin America. You need to know the countries, the borders, the cities, you need to know the, even the topography, the rivers. Uh, it's, it's absolutely critical for understanding the history and understanding the current state of Latin America. If you don't understand the map and the relationships, you're not going to understand Latin America at all. I mean, I actually, it took me, I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit it, but I actually had to go to Uruguay to clarify the Uruguay-Paraguay difference uh, for myself in, in South America. I got it now, though. I got it now. So. Yeah. <laughs> Study world soccer, and you'll learn Absolutely. very fast. Very quickly, that's right. <laughs> when I was an undergraduate, I took a class from a professor in Renaissance and Reformation, European, and the second, second day of class was a, a map of Europe. Mm -hmm. And we had to go up to the board and draw the map. And it didn't have to be accurate. But it had, we used blocks and triangles and things like that. But you needed to know where France was and where Spain was, generally where countries were. If you're going to talk about the Renaissance and tr movement and trade, you have to have an idea where these things are. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to, we didn't have to learn all the, like you said, all the capitals and things like that in the rivers. But we had to have a general idea of what's the spatial relationship between these, these places. Yeah, I tell you, if you want to have a fun party game, pull out a piece of paper and see if people can place the United States states. <laughs> Just draw the United States and see if you can place the states accurately. It's quite a hoot. <laughs> or even name them. <laughs> That's right. People no. get Texas right, though. Yeah. <laughs> now, Google Earth is an amazing resource. I've been uh, together with a colleague editing the memoir of the first Aggie valedictorian, who was actually a Texas German from down by Belleville. Uh, and we were looking for his farm, and um, somebody thought they knew where it was, and I looked up on Google Maps, and his father had a horse-driven cotton gin where the horses, you know, walk in a circle pulling a, uh, a sweep in order to turn the thing. 
you could still, to this day, see the uh, footprint of that cotton gin uh, on, the, on the pasture there, uh, just uh, outside the barn. So uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, resource from all, all kinds of uh, angles, and that, that's just one example. So what should we as academicians, National Geographic, <coughs> parents, teachers be doing to improve, to continue geographic education and, and make sure that we have a geographically literate society? So there's a couple of things that we at National Geographic have been really focusing on in recent uh, in the recent year and the recent couple of years. One of them that we think is really key is we call it explorer classrooms and we have a, a community of explorers at National Geographic and these are people that get grants to do science and conservation and photography and storytelling and they're a real resource for us on the geography education side of things because we can then we can hook up a live stream from these um, explorers in the field two classrooms. And so we've set that up and we've had, I think it's almost 80,000 students that have seen live stream and been able to ask questions of our explorers in the field. One of our um, explorers is an anthropologist named Lee Berger and he was doing an exploration in a cave in South Africa. And so he live streamed from the cave in South Africa to classrooms in the United States. And I think, Brenda, correct me if I'm wrong, several ones that were outside of the United States as well. Um, and so that's a way to engage students, get them interested in faraway places, let them see faraway places. So even if they're not leaving their hometown, they can have an experience of the world and scientists doing real work. And so that's one of the, one of the things that we've, we've tried to focus on. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. So. Well, again, I'm at the Bush School in the International Relations Department. We have courses on Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and the, and the Far East, of course. And our mission is the same as the vision of George H.W. Bush, which was to train students who share our view that public service is a noble calling. And we believe that you cannot be an effective, good public servant without a good knowledge of geography. So it's an important part of our curriculum, it's an important part of our classes, and as I said in my class, we're assigning the maps, maps quiz, uh, and so it's, we're trying to also teach the students then to go out into the world and share that uh, vision and view that geography is really important. Oh. Yeah, and I'm a huge fan of study abroad. I mean. Uh, you know, I would say it was a turning point in my life the first time I got to Europe, not until I was on a dissertation fellowship to Germany, but anytime anybody from study abroad office wants to come to one of my classes and give them a spiel promoting their program, I'm uh, delighted to have them. So uh, also, you know, uh, with language uh, learning, there's no substitute for total immersion. I mean, uh, you know, the internet does bring, well, it works both ways. Uh, it also brings American culture to Europe. You know, there, 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 are, there are cultural pessimists over here that think immigrants are never going to be Americanized, but because uh, now they can get, you know, Indian movies or wherever they're from on the internet or DVDs, but like Highway 6, those <laughs> mediums run both ways and they can just as easy bring mainstream culture into immigrant homes. And, you know, these cultural pessimists are worried about people being Americanized. The cultural pessimists in Europe are worried about their people becoming Americanized without even leaving home. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, the French Academy has a, a real deal with that, yes. don't they? Uh, yeah. I was going to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. So. You know, they, they're uh, fighting a losing battle trying to replace snappy American words like email or marketing with multisyllabic French ones, but uh, it's, it's not working for one of my uh, colleagues tells me about his... French nieces and nephews who, uh, you know, they only use the English terms for things like that. The French ones are dead in the water. Uh, you know, 
And Germany is similar. There's this one uh, kind of protester who wrote uh, a, a satirical book called Modern Talking auf Deutsch, and it runs through, you know, uh, 1,200 comments from, I don't know, uh, uh, Airbnb to Zipper, uh, <laughs> and, and, and satirizes them. And you almost have to know both English and German to understand the book, but that's no problem for Germans because, uh, you know, my wife is German. She speaks the world's most widely spoken language, whereas I don't. I'm not talking about Chinese. That only has the largest number of native speakers. I'm talking about English with a foreign accent. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. So I'd like to bring up a second key point about uh, being able to work, uh, you know, start working magic with geography education, and that's the, the real importance of respecting geography educators out there, the teachers that are on the front lines working with the students, and it's really important for us at National Geographic to work with them and respect the work that they do and try and help them with not just with materials, but we have a summer institute for geography teachers. We are working on a geography certification program so that they can be certified by National Geographic in certain areas of knowledge. And I think it's really critical for us to work with the geography teachers in the K through 12 realm so that they feel empowered to do more with geography than they might otherwise, the ones that aren't geographers or geography teachers. You know, many teachers are called on to teach geography that have very exactly. little geographic background. So one of the things that I mentioned that when I was growing up, we took vacations. And uh, kids today, I talk to my students in my class, and they've been to Colorado, but they flew to go skiing. They didn't learn much about anything of Texas or Colorado to get between here and there. And I'm taking a group of students over spring break to Colorado, and it's 13 and a half hours up there to Pueblo. <laughs> Whether you drive fast or drive slow, it takes 13 and a half hours. <laughs> and there's lots of stuff. And so when students travel with me, they're not going to have their iPad. They're not going to be looking at the little video on the back of the seat of the van to things like that. that I think that's really bad for students learning geography, is if they're not paying attention to what's going on around them. And traveling through Texas, spring will probably be a little bit early, but if you dr drive in early summer, you can go from here where they're harvesting wheat and go all the way up to the panhandle and the wheat's still green. And you can just see that whole change of the climate, the growth zones as you go there. Or you see cotton and various things like that. And so I think you know, just, and we, I've taken students just study abroad to Colorado. <laughs> and, and I used to go to the geography department when we'd take four day trips up there. And students tell me that it changed their lives. They had not been out of Texas and go someplace else and see other things and different things to see different people. Now some of you may know that Texans are often not welcome in Colorado. <laughs> there is a Colorado-Texas tomato war fight every summer to do that. Uh, Texans went up there to buy things, or to buy the place out and, and do that. But I think just paying attention to geography and, and what's around, uh, probably weird because one of the five things geography is movement. And, you know, so how do things move? But just animals, people, goods, very stuff to, and I do go back to the five themes of geography instead of the 18 strands because I think they're easier. <laughs> well, I think what you just described is actually very much in line with one of the things we are very much promoting now, which has fewer steps, and I'd like to use this, is the idea of geo-inquiry. And what you've described is, in an informal way, the idea of developing a geographic mindset as you're driving from Texas to Colorado. First, you look, you see, mm -hmm. you look at patterns, you look as a geographer at the world and you start, start scrutinizing it. Then you ask questions about it. So asking questions is critical. And when we're working with teachers who are working with students, the next step is to collect some data, whether it's photographs or temperature, you collect some data about what you're looking at. And then you can start 
analyzing it and creating things from it, things like maps or graphs or tables. And then you can act on that information and try and make a difference in your community. And so that's, I love that because it's, that's only five. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And uh, it, it's a way to, to help uh, teachers and students start thinking like geographers and looking at the world and trying to make a difference in the world if they're looking at a, a local problem, for example. You know, another potential collaborator for uh, people like your society uh, at the high school and junior high level is language teachers, particularly Spanish That's teachers. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. you know, my wife's students, she teaches, she's a German teaching Spanish <laughs> in Brian High. Uh, her kids can find Uruguay on the map, at least, mm -hmm. <laughs> if they've been paying attention. So, uh, you know, they, they, that, that would really uh, be a complementary, uh, you know, interdisciplinary, uh, you might say, collaboration there. Absolutely. So you were saying earlier, Alex, about geography, every, you know, that's the place where history occurs. And, and my friend, Sir Bednars, who Brenda knows, tells me that, you know, everything takes place someplace. Right. And so you don't have to have anything else. You just start with geography. And then it's how do people act in there? How do people act in the past? And you've got history, you've got sociology, you've got psychology, you've got all the, the social sciences in geography because it's all taking place. And there's those things going on in geography that cause these things to be way they, the way they are as to where you settle things. And stuff. Actually, Sarah told me about those, those five geographic things. And I decided they were pretty good. And so we can. Uh, observe historic things, we can ask historic questions, yes. <laughs> and do it in history, or do it in political science. Those five things are really good. It's a good framework for people Absolutely. to think about. Economic geography, looking at the patterns of where clothing is made, and mm -hmm. that, that's all of a sudden, it's a, it's a geographic story. Mm -hmm. So, I would really like, and several years ago, or many years ago, in textbooks and things like that, if you saw a picture of the United States, when you hit that southern border, it all turned gray. There was no country there. And if you went to the north, it all turned gray there. Canada has just a flat gray expanse. Or you would just see the country with nothing around it. There was no Canada or Mexico, just the United States. We stuck cartographers right. call those floaters. Floaters, well, yeah, they're floaters. <laughs> and, and you would see even European countries and things like that, Switzerland, so there'd be the floater of Switzerland there without anything. And so then they went to the, the situation where they started putting them in context. And they had the rest of the country around them so that you could see what it was. And the Great Plains didn't stop at the northern border. It actually extended up into Canada. I, I think, unfortunately, from, from my perspective, I think we've gotten away from using so much of that type of illustration in newspapers. You said, that, you know, in the better, bigger newspapers, they do that. But to, I think if we could have more illustrations that had places. Um, I'm reading a book right now, um, The Ice Ghosts, and it's about the Franklin ex expedition into the Antarctic. And I just chafe at the, the poorness of the map. <laughs> that There are three maps, and they, they talk about places, but they're not labeled on the map. And I don't know where they are. They're all in the Arctic to, to do that. So I, you know, if we could get people using maps, getting industry using maps and, and doing that, I think would be a great show the value of that and for people to, to place things to do that. So. So we're about out of time of our portion. Do you have any last thoughts about why geography matters? And I think we've covered it pretty well. Well, I was, I was, gonna, I was thinking, uh, Walter used to teach a course, a really strange course over in the history department. Why would you ever want to study that? It's called quantitative history, quantitative research and history. Um, I audited the course with him, and uh, I found it fascinating. And it was all about geography. Because we, one of the things we used was a dictionary of American mayors. And this was a data set that one of his graduate students put in. And it had mayors in cities. It had where they came from, their ethnicity, their religion, their age, when they were elected. And we could look at patterns as to where people were and what cities had different types of ethnic groups to um, do that. And then we looked at the voting thing. We looked at what, Brooklyn. Albany, three places in, is in New York. And, um, Buffalo and the Big Apple. Yeah, and so, but to do that, and so that wasn't the geography course, but certainly to understand that relationship between those various things was, so, a, I thought, a, a wonderful class. I have a very good example from the United States 
this year on why geography and maps are so important. There's two cases at the Supreme Court about gerrymandering. There surely are. Gerrymandering is all about geography and maps. It's about the population distribution in, a, in an area and how it gets divided up for representation. And that is all about geography and maps. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what the court decides on these cases. That's exactly what you're talking about, how you present information. Absolutely. And you know, how you lie with maps or how you, you know, who's, whose ox is being gored by this particular thing? Who's being advantaged by doing it this way versus doing it that way? to do that, so, so that will be. the states of Maryland, where I live, and <laughs> Wisconsin are the two states. That's and right. One yeah. is gerrymandering to advantage Democrats, and one's gerrymandering to advantage Republicans. So it'll be very interesting to see how it turns out. The, the Democrats in California started in 1980. I happened to be on a postdoc <laughs> at Caltech at the time, and uh, they were doing the number crunching there, but of course, Californians have since sworn off and uh, do it by a nonpartisan and you, commission. And, and, uh, you know how old it <laughs> is. You know, Jerry was a governor in Massachusetts. That's and that's, right. that's yeah. where it all started, was uh, yeah. Governor Jerry gerrymandering the, uh, the towns around Massachusetts. Now, I guess part of the interesting thing related to that was. And that was like 1800, yeah. like 17, late 1700s, early 1800s. One of the interesting things is that Wisconsin case was, was brought by Democrats. Yeah. And in this last midterm election, a Democrat won in the district that was supposedly privileging <laughs> Republicans. And so now what's that going to do to their court case we'll see. to do that, that it, it didn't work out? So do we have some questions that somebody's been? Hi, Robert Holsweiss. I'm the deputy director of the library. Uh, you received index cards on your way in. And there's, in, there's young ladies and gentlemen, ladies it looks like, that will uh, hand you an index card if you have a question, and uh, we won't be able to handle all of them, but uh, we certainly want to get to as many of them as possible. While I'm looking at the first round, I do have a question, and it's kind of bounced off something that Alex mentioned uh, earlier when we were talking. Um, I, I think it would be good to share with the audience how you change a map. And when so it's more than just drawing a line on a map. And then um, following up on that, if uh, Raymond or Walter want to comment on like Central American or German map making during times of crisis, like the Rhineland, you know, mm -hmm. and whose map is more important and who's doing the drawing and who's doing the saying. So Alex, if you would, while I'm looking at some of the questions, if you would kind sure. of talk about your work in that area with the World Court and things like that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, sure, there's a lot that goes into making a decision about where a line should be. And uh, some of the work I did before I worked at National Geographic was assisting in boundary dispute cases that went to world courts. And so this is two countries that instead of going to war had decided that they would take it to the world court and two legal teams would argue the merits of where the boundary should be. And there were often historical reasons why one country claimed one line and one country claimed another line. And I worked, for example, for the government of Croatia in a dispute with Slovenia. And this got back into the Austro-Hungarian Empire. We did a lot of research on historical maps. And the five-member tribunal made a decision that the line would go in a certain place. And so that's a line that will then get adopted for National Geographic into our maps. And when I say our maps, we're not talking about drawing lines on paper maps anymore, even though we do produce paper maps, we're talking about bringing the lines into a geographic database <coughs> that we use for our mapping. And Google has one that they use for their mapping. Apple has one that they use for their mapping. And uh, there are a lot, uh, it's probably about six or seven major online mapping services, and they all maintain their own map data. So you can look at a line, for example, the lines of claim for sovereignty in Kashmir, in Asia, and you will see different lines in different map engines. Check it out. Another curious thing is that if you look at Google Maps in China, you see a certain set of lines. If you look at Google Maps in India, you'll see a different set of lines. Mm -hmm. For the same area. For the same area. And in the United States, it will be a more neutral view. So Google has to adapt its mapping engine, its online mm -hmm. maps, to different countries to be able to, to do business there. Well, there's some places that they're where the line exists is barely known between Oman and Saudi Arabia. 
between Yemen and Saudi well, Arabia. Those, those, you, those have been updated. Yeah, we've got new little, lines for those. No, nope. take yeah. a look at our take a look at our latest atlas. <laughs> nice solid lines. So nice. there were there were agreements recently between so, those countries. So, so they actually okay. have agreed lines now, so, so, and that does happen in the world. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, so, I'll get you a new atlas. So, okay. There's been a and there's there was a long time dispute between Texas and Oklahoma as to where the border was yeah. along the, the Red River, as yes. to which part of it was. It's a very famous dispute. Yeah. yeah. Not too long ago, I took a trip down to McAllen, Texas, and it was really fun oh. to hear the folks down in McAllen say that, you know, back in the day, people would just flow freely and families would move from one side to the other, and they'd set up a house here, and then they'd just move to the other side, and the border was the river and the river would shift every now and then, and the border would just shift along with it. So there's things that are built based on the old river that are not relevant anymore for marking the border. It's really pretty fascinating. So. Yeah, Kaskaskia, Illinois is stranded on the Missouri side now, too. <laughs> yeah. right. well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I well, always get a window seat whenever I can, and especially flying over the Mississippi Delta. It's mm -hmm. amazing. Uh, it's all of the curves. So, um, between Switzerland and Italy, um, they're changing borders because glaciers are melting. What does that have to do with the border between Switzerland and Italy? So, Really, you need to, and this was a good example of one case in which the river changes and the border changes between the U.S. and Mexico, and one case between Illinois and Missouri where the river changes and the border doesn't. So it really depends on what the agreements are. So that's the agreement, the agreement between Mexico and the United States states very, very specifically that the river is the border, and if it changes, there's, a, there's some nuance to it, but if it changes, essentially the border changes. Now, between Switzerland and Italy, there's very likely a treaty that's not one I'm familiar with. That's a relatively stable international boundary. I'm usually looking at the ones that are, that are shifting. But in general, it will be specified in a way that it, the boundary would be set and that it, it would not change. Now, if you had a landslide that affected the watershed so that it shifted, then you would have a question that would need to be resolved. And essentially, if, a, if there was a landslide that shifted the ridge line, then you would have a new international boundary there. Okay, okay so we have a question. Is, I taught AP human geography at high school level and experienced Texas dropping the requirement for geography. Can you comment on why that happened and if you see it changing now or in the future? Uh, well, I don't know the history of, of that change. I don't know the details of it. But hopefully it will be reconsidered because I think the AP Human Geography class is a very valuable one. It's a very good one, well designed, and uh, uh, students really benefit from it. So, so, so I know the teachers and the geography teachers in Texas protested this greatly when it was being considered. And uh, my understanding is that the the dropping of it and making it elective rather than required was a way for that not all students might be wanting to go, go to college. And so that this may have stood as a barrier as to one of the courses I'm having to take and not take some other elective um, to do that. Um, I'm also somewhat skeptical as the understanding of some of our legislators and people as to the, to the value of geography. That, uh, well, yeah, I remember when I was in geography class, so I had to memorize all these places, know all these names and everything like that. <laughs> and it, I've never used it. It's not been useful. So why do we require students to take it? And, uh, yeah, part of my job as a geographer is explaining to, to people what geography really is. Right. And that it does include some of that. It's important to know some of that. But that it's uh, it's, it's about, more than that. It's much more than that. It's yeah. about what we've been talking about tonight. And the AP Human Geography class is well designed to be much more than memorizing places. Okay. The globe has changed a lot since most of us in the room were children. Will there See, will the changes slow down? Are geopolitical lines becoming more permanent? I think that's a good one for you, Alex, since that's lines you know, and mapping. That, that brings to mind a cartoon about the time that the Soviet Union was breaking up and it showed Eastern Europe splintering in all different pieces and Western Europe consolidating. But um, I guess that has kind of hit pause, the Western European aspect yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. uh, whether Eastern Europe or 
Central Asia continues to splinter, I guess, is anyone's guess. It's a very, it's a very good question. And uh, I think if you look at the last 50 years, I would say that, it, that the, the pace of change has slowed down a little bit. We haven't had a new country since Su South Sudan mm -hmm. became a country in 2011. Um, and, you know, there was a big flurry during uh, President Bush's time of uh, splitting in Eastern Europe and the Soviet, former Soviet Union. Yeah. Um, so I think it actually probably has slowed down a little bit. Um, there's minor changes, there's quite a few disputes, but I, in my role as a geographer at National Geographic, I keep track of these disputes, and a lot of the areas that we've shown in gray that means they're unresolved sovereignty have stayed that way for a long time. And they don't seem to resolve. <laughs> there I think are some Pacific Island nations whose days might be numbered. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's actually, story. and there's some very interesting sovereignty questions about that. So if the people on Kiribati need to leave Kiribati because the islands are slowly being covered by water, um, they're making plans to have land on Fiji so that you will have a sovereign nation inside another sovereign nation. Hmm. And that could be a potential source of new change. So we were, like I just said, my wife and I were just in Hawaii, and the volcanoes making, continue to make land to, to do that. And so who, who owns that new land? As far as I know, the island of Hawaii. The island of Hawaii, the state does. So. It's certainly part of the United States. Right, it's part of the United States. Yeah. So. yeah. So for kids in middle school here in College Station, what opportunities exist for more, to foster more interest? There is the GOB and the UIL maps graph charts, but are there other programs? And I don't know. Are there other, does National Geographic have other programs besides GOB and? So, so we do have these new, uh, this new program that Brenda was telling me about. Uh, it's called GeoChallenge. And it's, it's something that schools can participate in. They don't need to go to National Geographic in Washington. They can participate in from where they are. And there's a, a geo-challenge question posed. And the classroom, under the guidance of the teacher, will come up with a solution to the problem and send it in. It's a, sort of a competition um, to send in your solution to the geographic problem. So it's called geo-challenge. You can find it at natgeoed.org. That's our education website. And it's a, it's a great new program. There's some really good uh, questions coming up. And the deadline is just passed for the first one, but there'll be another one coming up. So we just started this. It's an exciting new program. I know that ESRI, the GIS pro people, had that community program where you could write in and you could have community and build things like that. And so I think uh, GIS, and using GIS would certainly be a way of helping uh, spark an interest in geography and understanding it because of the layers you can put um, on, the, on the map to do that. Which sort of leads to the next question, which was for you, Alex, for the geographer. Could you speak more to the importance of biogeography? What were the most fascinating topics in this field for you? So this is what I studied as an undergraduate, mm -hmm. not as a graduate, but as an undergraduate uh, student, I studied biogeography. And I studied something that's called island biogeography. And it's very relevant for understanding patterns in the world. I was actually studying mountaintops. And there's a special vegetation type, you know, the little alpine tundra on the mountaintops in New England. And that's what I was looking at. But you can also think of places like the Galapagos, where you have speciation and evolution happening between islands. So you have these discrete units uh, of land or, in, or ecosystem. And uh, it's a way to understand uh, evolution. Uh, and they've actually found that the speciation, the, the development of new species happens far faster than they thought in these, in these islands of biogeography. So it's, just, it's understanding the patterns of the distribution of plants and animals. And in an era of climate change, we have to understand that really well to know what pressures are going to be put onto certain animal and plant populations as the climate shifts. And there's National Geographic explorers down in the Andes that are actually studying the migration up the elevation slopes in the Andes. As the climate starts warming, there's plants and animals that are starting to move up already. And they're starting to understand how that might be happening. 
And there are crops that are moving north in the United crops States. Crops moving north? Fire ants moving north? Um, <laughs> armadillos. Yeah, armadillos have, moving they north? They have armadillos in Illinois it's, now. It's they happening. Didn't, didn't. I never saw one when I was a kid in Missouri, but uh, they're north of the Missouri River now. No, they're in Minnesota. They have no. Yeah. So, 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 <laughs> so. Well, another thing of, of biogeography would be uh, animal populations and the encroachment of urban areas and how it, the necessity of having a certain amount of property or area for species to survive, for, for groups to survive, Absolutely. Uh, to do that. And so as we populate and develop certain areas, we cut those channels off. And so the idea that there are some places that are leaving corridors so that uh, yep. animals can move. And so that's the bio, bio geography. Also, I think uh, this would be the same areas that the, uh, the new urban resident, the coyote, and studying the coyotes, the coyotes in Central Park, and coyotes in downtown Chicago, and you think coyotes were, you know. They're in Washington, D.C. And they're Washington, D.C. So, you know, what is the geography going on there? Um, years ago, when the Lyme disease got very great um, in, in New York, they discovered that it was in the area that there had been dairy farms, which people had moved into and, and cut up and planted, but people growing houses want to have shrubbery, and shrubbery is great for deer. And the deer carry the tick that have the Lyme disease. And so to understand that geographic relation, you know, why is this going on? Why all of a sudden to have this, to do that? So. For the previous question about potential programming in the area for geosciences, um, the College of Geosciences at Texas a and actually does a summer internship program for high school students called GOX. Sounds and they great. Thank you. So for, I guess we have one last multi-question page. How much unexplored frontier tier is there left in the world? Is there still room, much room for discovery geographically speaking? Well, I'll take the first stab on that, but feel free to uh, add on to it. Uh, it's a question that we actually often get at National Geographic. Like, is there, are there areas left to explore? Um, you have to get a little more creative about what you consider exploration and where you might want to go. Um, if you consider the fact that only about, uh, I think it's 15% of the ocean floor has been mapped um, accurately, um, there is a lot of underwater exploration left to do. There are seamounts, big features in the oceans, being discovered all the time. Um, so the oceans, especially the deep oceans, are an area of, of exploration, absolutely. Um, you know, microscopic biology, like really tiny organisms, they're being found. I mean, if you talk to E.O. Wilson, the famed uh, biologist, he talks about how many insect species are still undiscovered. Um, so there is a lot of discovery left to do. So I would not discourage students from studying any of these things, studying biology, geology, uh, ocean science. These are all areas where there's lots more discovery to happen. Archaeologists have been using Google Earth quite a bit lately. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you can see patterns from above that you cannot see on the ground. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, footprints from, from I mean, uh, not literal footprints, but footprints of uh, buildings or land use that are, you know, millennium back. But uh, you can see traces still from Google Earth. Particularly in the Middle East and Egypt and the road to Uber. To, to find those various things by able to look and see the, the patterns on that. To, that was one of the things when I was working with uh, Mission Geography, the thing is that we were using those maps to, to look at and have stu students examine those type of things to see that. So, Raymond? No, I agree. I was thinking of the ocean floors. The ocean floors are a lot more difficult even to navigate than space for a lot of the scientific technology we have now, and I think that's one of the last real frontiers. So, so the, this question is, how important is human geography, especially in places like the Middle East? That is, We've got two minutes left, because we told is, tell wow. people we'd be over 7.15. So. That, uh, that is the hot spot of human geography, the, the mix of ethnicities, religions, uh, and the history there, uh, the complex history. 
uh, it, it just all, it all comes together in the Middle East, and uh, it's, it's a great area to study historically, and it's certainly a very vital area to understand from a public policy standpoint in, mm -hmm. in looking at how the United States relates to the different countries, you know, Syria, Turkey, Israel, Lebanon, these are just really important places for us to understand so we can have a more informed uh, interrelationship with, with the governments and with the people. The, the question goes on to say, what went wrong in 1914 <laughs> in the Middle East? And what, what it was, the French and the British sat down and drew lines. Yeah. They divided up the country, the area, into Lebanon, Jordan, There's, Syria, Several infamous dates of European uh, uh, Europeans yeah. drawing lines on maps. The yeah. partition of Africa being a, another, another really classic example. And so they one, drew that and they ignored. One thing that went wrong about it is they didn't know much about the area where they were drawing. Yeah, right. There we go. Yeah, they were just places that said, well, we'll just draw this line across here. And that's, that's why when you look at those countries, <clears throat> most of the, the border lines are straight lines. Because they just said, well, we'll just draw the line across here. And so they ignored cultural groups geographic features because they didn't know that. So, so we're at 7.15. We told people we'd be through at 7.15. And so um, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, there's been a request that the Bush ambassadors join us up here on stage for a couple pictures. And then we're going to go out in the lobby and we'll be glad to stand around and talk with you if you'd like to talk to some of us after for about 15, 20 minutes to do that. So I thank you all for coming. Let's give them a round of applause for being a good audience.